How are we going? How many do we have online now? I'm just. We've got 20 yeah. online. Oh, okay. Look, we might just, um, we might get started. So apologies, people, if there was an issue with the link. Um, we have just switched over how we're organising these talks. So, um, yep, there might have been just a bit of a connection issue, but we've got lots of people joining us. And we're certainly very excited to be welcoming um, Professor Adrian Barnett to speak with us today. Um, I might disclose, um, or I should disclose that the lecture is being recorded. So by joining, you're giving um, your consent for the meeting to be recorded, but certainly if people aren't comfortable with that, they're welcome to jump off and listen to the recorded version. Um, just, yep, just to welcome you all to the New South Wales Health Statewide Biobank. So um, our speaker today is Professor Adrian Barnett. He's joining us from Queensland where um, people are not in lockdown, which is, which is fantastic. Um, many of you will probably aware, be aware of Adrian and his career, but he is a professor of statistics and he's worked for over 25 years in health and medical research, and he's a current NHMRC senior research fellow. Um, and he was also the president of the Statistical Society of Australia from 2018 to 2020. And Adrian's research interests are very broad, but can largely concern improving statistical practice to re reduce research waste. And I think for those of us that are in that field, we realise that there really can't be enough of this kind of research, I think. So um, look, we're very much looking forward to hearing Adrian today. Because of the number of people online, if you have questions, it might be good to just pop them into the chat and I'll read them out. Um, I'll read them out towards the end if that works for people, but we'll see how we go. So thank you, Adrian. We're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you, Jenny. I'll just share my screen. Hopefully that's nice and clear. OK, so first thing to say is this is very much joint work with uh, Anna Scott uh, from Bond, Natalie Taylor uh, in New South Wales and Jenny Byrne, you've just heard from in Sydney. It really is a team effort. So I live and work on the lands of the Terrible and Yuggera people, a uh, beautiful place to live and work, and I acknowledge uh, their elders past, present and emerging, and uh, I acknowledge that QT has always been a place of science and learning. So I think ethics is vital for research. I'm not advocating for some kind of wild west today. Um, I think doing ethics right makes you a better researcher. I'm always massively grateful for the people who take part in the research that I run and for people who share their data with me. Um, and this is just my perspective as a researcher. I have strong biases. Obviously, I am very biased towards getting access to data because that helps me in my career, but also hope it uh, helps me uh, come up with answers and make the world a better place. So look, I'm going to be quite forthright in my opinions, and if you think I'm wrong, uh, or if, you, if you've got a different opinion, I'll be very interested to hear. I want to start with four bad examples that I think summarise a lot of the issues. So this is the first example. Um, you can see the title there, Process Trumps Potential for Public Good. So this was uh, an ARC funded study and it was a national study looking at data linkage of children when they got their vaccine to then look at um, safety outcomes. So pretty important study, uh, particularly uh, in the current environment. So it took an incredible six years uh, for these people to finally get the data. Oh, there is a bit of background noise. I don't know if people need to mute. It took six years for this group to finally get the data, um, which is just incredible. And of course, all their funding ended uh, before the data was received. Western Australia withdrew. Uh, so it wasn't a truly national study anymore, which obviously has consequences. And the authors called this, the process is convoluted and inconsistent. And it involved extensive negotiation between 18 different agencies. So, Look, good on the authors for uh, publicising this and, and putting this in a paper because I think this is really important and in, in an era where we're all supposed to have perfect CVs and be wonderful researchers, it's, it's great that they were willing to admit this, this failure. And if we talk about bad examples, I mean, for me, this example uh, alone is enough to show that there's a serious issue. I mean, six years is just an incredible amount of time 
And if I think about all the money and time and effort that went into this, if we spent, I'd love to spend all that time and money and effort again on a some sort of inquiry to look at these things and what went wrong. And just a quick aside on data linkage, there's this really nice paper by Alan et al. Oh, and all my slides are online, so all these uh, names are, are hyperlinked, so you can find the paper. And they talked about, while there is strong protection against risk to privacy and multiple avenues of redress, there's no redress where harms result from a failure to release data for research. So there is this kind of asymmetry. Um, the, you know, the, the committees are there to prevent harm to participants, but if studies are blocked or delayed unnecessarily, then there is also a harm, harms can occur on the other side. And this is a really interesting paper and it talks about data custodians may fear becoming a scapegoat if something goes wrong. But what the paper pointed out, which was really interesting to me, was if a data custodian has done their job thoroughly and properly, if something goes wrong with the study, the lawyers would never come after the data custodian. The lawyers would go after the researcher. So the, and the ultimate um, responsibility does rest with us. Um, so I think if data custodians um, can then focus on doing their job without fearing becoming a scapegoat, but we do have a bit of a blame culture problem here that I will talk about uh, again later on. So my first example was a huge national study. Here's a, a bad example from a really tiny study, really. Uh, so this is from some colleagues of mine who uh, make a lot of medical assist devices, including artificial hearts. So for those artificial hearts, there has to be a, a point where the machine and uh, interacts uh, with the outside world with a battery or something, and you tend to have these drive lines. Now, sometimes these drive lines can get a really nasty fungal infection on them. So all these people wanted to do was instead of when they then have to replace these devices on people, which is a big operation, they wanted to take that drive line with the fungal infection on it and take it. It used to go into the bin. They didn't want to put it in the bin. They wanted to take it to the lab and study it. So that took 11 uh, or more months in uh, approval time. There was 106 emails. The valuable samples were lost and the authors talked about this being both unethical and an over bureaucratization. And of course, all the patients were signed up to this because they wanted to know what happened. The doctors really wanted to know this. So this just seems like a crazy example where everybody wants this to happen, but the bureaucracy um, just really blocked it. And there are loads more examples I could have chosen from. Um, there really is quite a lot of published Australian researchers on this in all sorts of fields from all sorts of areas who have encountered these problems and decided to write a paper about it um, because they were so um, cheesed off with their experience. The last two examples aren't published are just from my own um, experiences. So I wanted, we had a randomised trial of thermal clothing for heart failure patients. Believe it or not, Australia has one of the worst winter death rates for, for um, cardiovascular disease and if you're in Queensland at the moment, you'll appreciate why. If you're in a house, it's freezing inside our houses here. So we wanted to, we had a randomised trial of thermal clothing. We thought it'd be a good idea to chat with patients before we ran the trial to see if we can um, improve the study design or all the sort of clothing we gave. Now, the, the documentation to do that involved a NEF, a protocol, a cover letter, a participant information sheet and consent form and CVs to the researchers. The approval pro process took four months. The interviews with patients lasted two hours. Um, so this, for me, was just not commensurate with the levels of risk. And it was it was a worthwhile two hours, but it has absolutely put me off uh, doing this again. And at the moment, we do have this push for a greater patient involvement in research, which I am totally behind. And I think uh, it is a good idea. But when this kind of thing happens, um, you know, I just I, I look at the time and effort and, and, and consider spending my time elsewhere. The last example was a bit more controversial. I should say I mostly do low risk research, but occasionally um, higher risk things do come up. So you may not know, but um, drive through, uh, fast food drive throughs are actually, I think, one of the um, highest levels of pollution exposure in the whole country. They're, these are poorly ventilated spaces with vehicles idling all the time, often diesel vehicles uh, spewing out huge amounts of pollution. Diesel cars are not green. Uh, that's one of the biggest cons the car companies ever pulled, but convincing people that diesel is green. And then we have these often young workers by these windows, potentially exposed 
um, to huge, uh, relatively huge levels of pollution. It's also really easily fixed with air windows. Air pollution is literally as light as air. So you can have these blasting uh, window that you can put your hand through still, but the pollution doesn't get through it. So I, we, uh, together with some experts in pollution monitoring, uh, set up a study to set up monitors and uh, monitors in the people, monitors all around the areas. And then I looked to engage with lots of fast food companies. I wrote to them, I phoned them, I turned up at their door. None of them uh, agreed to participate. So what I then did was I reapplied for ethics after getting that initial approval to conceal the purpose of, of the monitoring study from employers so that just to get some employees to just to wear a little, it's kind of like a little badge that would soak up the amount of benzene they were exposed to, um, but that was rejected. Um, so I was bitterly disappointed about that and I still look at drive throughs all the time now and, and think about the harm that, that is potentially going on. And then related to that uh, different study that, that you may have heard of called the UQ bus study where Paul Fritters and his uh, PhD student read so. And they did a really interesting thing where they had testers walk onto buses with a faulty go-kart. So, you know, they went to tap on, this is a, sorry, this is a, what's it called, in, um, a Mikey card or whatever, in, I can't remember what it's called in Sydney. Uh, you know, your travel card, your plastic travel card, they walked onto the bus and it went boop. And then they asked if they could ride for free. And what they did was they, you know, they did this in a proper and a nicely designed study and they randomly uh, um, sent on people who of different races, uh, different genders, and, and some of them were in army uniform and some not. And the result that they found was quite astonishing that white testers were accepted on the bus to ride for free 72% of the time versus only 36% for black testers. So that is an absolutely enormous difference, um, which, is, which was really quite shocking. Now, the government didn't like this result, the transport uh, government, government didn't like this result, they put pressure on UQ. UQ then pretty much, for want of a better phrase, threw Paul under the bus and he was um, investigated, the, the ethics were brought up even though he clearly did have clearance and a, a lot of personal cost to himself. I think it took about three years, he was eventually cleared but he was demoted and, and he now works outside of Australia. So there are some, those last two examples were perhaps potentially tricky uh, studies where it can be a bit of a minefield, but just because they're a minefield, ignoring the minefield is, is no answer. It's a good idea to go in uh, and get rid of mines. That's what we do with minefields. We have experts who go in, who know what they're doing uh, and they can fix these issues and we can make the world a better place. So I would definitely, my strong leaning is towards if we have to upset a few people, if, if that upset is easily counterbalanced in both of these examples by the potential uh, knowledge that we gain. And I would say for the fast food companies, they may have well have gained from those studies, even if they were upset, because if you could install these air windows, you'd probably find your staff would be less sick. Personally, I know traveling in my dad's old uh, diesel van, I used to often arrive at places really sick from uh, breathing in the pollution. So traffic pollution is, a, is a, 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 a class one carcinogen, but it also will just make you very sick. So they may have found that their um, staff absentee levels went down. Similarly for the bus study, I appreciate that the government might have been upset and bus drivers might have been upset, but I really hope that there was some serious reflection on that. Uh, and, you know, if you talk to people who've experienced racism, that kind of everyday racism is really exhausting uh, and makes life really exhausting. So to know about that, I think it, it's much better for society. So why does this sort of thing happen? Well, uh, uh, Guilliman et al. did this really nice study that I'll refer to a lot where they interviewed uh, members of HREC committees. And here's a great quote. I was once told by the chairperson of an ethics committee that he saw its role as making sure that the university didn't get sued. So that is not part of a research ethics committee. In no way is it the ethics committee's responsibility to stop the university from getting sued. So, so they should not be uh, looking out to block anything that's dangerous or embarrassing. And that can have a, actually a very chilling effect um, on research. And then another HREC member said to ensure that somebody is not going off on a frolic that will destroy or damage the reputation of the university. 
you know, it's, it, just that word frolic, you know, that, that I find that really interesting that, you know, there's this idea that um, researchers are kind of just doing this stuff willy nilly to, um, to get publications or, or I don't know what. And then another interesting reflection. So this little Satsuma here is supposed to represent uh, brain surgery. Um, talking to uh, an NHMRC expert on ethics reminded me of an interesting thing, which I think I've forgotten, where let's say, for example, we're doing a study of brain surgery, comparing doing brain surgery in the morning to brain surgery in the afternoon to see if we get better outcomes. When we put that ethics application in, we only have to talk about the difference between the morning and the afternoon. We don't have to justify doing brain surgery from first principles. So it's just the additional risk that we need to talk about. But I think often um, when we're in these controversial areas, we feel like we have to take on the entire risk. Is there too much oversight in Australia? So this is a nice study from Anna Scott, who uh, compared a lot of, well, sorry, just four different countries in terms of what sort of research was exempted from low risk and found that the broadest set of exemptions exist in the Netherlands and the narrowest in Australia. And I certainly experienced this personally when with a PhD student I was working with, you know, we had to spend four or five months uh, for a very low risk study of just looking at uh, do people share their data. Soon after we'd published another paper came out from the Netherlands and their ethics section was this was exempt, we didn't need to do this. So if you think about that, we're, we're definitely harming our competitiveness there for our PhD students. They have to spend all this extra time filling out forms, uh, waiting around while other countries can just get on and do this low risk research. I would also say we're, we're competitively disadvantaged here in Australia. So we do a lot of work uh, with the hospitals here in Queensland and, uh, you know, investigating little things that they might have changed in the hospital to see the change on outcomes. Now, when we do that, or when we pitch for bids, you know, we have to talk about ethics and, and, uh, and how we're going to get the data and, and what we're going to do with the data. Whereas one of the big four accountancy firms don't have to do that. They just literally send an email saying, here's the data we want, please send us this data and they get it. So that to me is very unfair. And uh, so universities are being disadvantaged on that front as well. A lot of people talk about ethics creep, that the, the comments you get back from ethics are sort of nothing to do with the ethical issues. Uh, a lot of comments on typographical comments, uh, on font, on layout, um, which I yeah, do find annoying. And it may not be that serious, but it kind of undermines your confidence uh, in the process when you're getting all this additional stuff. And here's a quote from the Guillemin et al study. So to tinker with the method methodology at the edges, I think it's outside their remit. So um, this is maybe a bit of a grand uh, analogy that I'm drawing here with the famous picture of, of Christ that, you know, I'm not saying that all researchers, we're the true artists and the ethics people are just the daubers. I'm actually really interested in what the ethics committee are going to say about my study, but I want their expertise in terms of their ethics. I don't need comments on spelling. And certainly another thing, and I've definitely experienced this as well, is when you put in a standardised questionnaire uh, and, and they start to make edits to that. I mean, you, you're just not going to get that published if you've changed the wording on it. And then a bit more concerningly, again, in this uh, Guillermo Natal study where they interviewed ethics committee members and, and found that 13 of the 14 ethics committee members indicated that they were aware of the national statement, but did not often refer to it. And then even more concerningly, three ethics members had not read the national statement. So if they'd read the national statement, they would know that it says in the national statement that they're expected to be familiar with the national statement. And I thought it'd be a good idea to reread the national statement uh, before this talk. And I found it a bit long to read. So I've actually created an audio version so you can listen to it while you're walking your dog or something like that. And it was very interesting to reread it. And I think it is a good idea to, to keep our familiarity with that. OK, so it's not just ethics committees. I think researchers do bear some responsibility here as well. Um, we are subject to these ridiculous pressures and uh, targets these days, and a lot of us do do research that's just too fast. And I know talking to ethics committee uh, colleagues that um, a lot of applications they get are just very poor quality. And then actually Caitlin Vandenberg and, and some colleagues did an actual study of this and found that the quality of the submission 
such as correct attachments, up-to-date documents, clear information, could account for a significant proportion of the burden and delay associated with ethical review. So, there, yeah, I can't remember the exact percent, but there was a huge proportion of applications that just hadn't put on the attachments. So, you know, that's very fixable uh, and we could definitely improve there. I think there are some hidden costs to this. So this was uh, a study run by Anna. Uh, you can see the title there. The, the ethics approval took 20 months on a trial, which was meant to help terminate our cancer patients. In the end, we had to send the funding back. So we, we get a lot of, we've had a lot of comments like that. So this was another survey of Australian health and medical uh, HREC members and health and medical researchers. One question we asked the researchers was, have you ever changed or abandoned a project? So we found 43% of researchers reported changing projects in, in anticipation of obstacles from the ethical review process. And another 25% of researchers reported abandoning projects. Uh, and certainly I've already talked about that where, you know, there's whole projects now I just won't consider uh, because it's just so difficult. And interesting things like, you know, research methods were altered so a project could be classified as low and negligible risk rather than higher risk to avoid a full ethics review. So, you know, in, in the efforts of making our life easier, researchers are changing what they do. But, you know, that can have costs. We're, we're possibly not doing as good a research uh, as we'd like. We got some great quotes out of this. So Richard talks about avoiding obtaining data from certain groups, for example, those under 18 years old, pregnant women, Indigenous people and those with a disability. So, you know, I can, of course, understand the reason why these are considered special groups in ethics, but there has to be an understanding that there is a cost to that as well and that these groups could well be understudied um, because of these difficulties with just getting ethics. Another cost, reducing the number of HREX involved, especially those known to have a few sittings a year and very long lead times. So you, people, and I was talking with Jenny just about this beforehand, people will avoid certain HREX. There's, there's a HREX shopping going on. But of course, if you do that, you're, well, you're reducing the power and generalizability of your study. But also, those populations covered by those HREX are, are potentially missing out um, on um, getting involved in research. So this is an interesting one. I'm an Aboriginal researcher undertaking Aboriginal community health research in my own community. The hatred regarding my situation as a conflict of interest. So I changed my ethics application from CIA to CID so I could continue to engage with my community. Without knowing the details of that, just based on that quote, I mean, that seems to me to be a terrible outcome. Uh, you know, there's nothing without us about us. With, uh, nothing about us without us. We, we want Aboriginal researchers to be leading these uh, studies. I'm sure that's a conflict of interest that could have been managed and that person's career has now just been harmed because they're no longer CIA. Many projects I've been involved in have to be abandoned because the ethics approval process takes too long to revoice, especially for junior researchers. And I've seen this repeatedly for PhDs. You know, PhDs are only three years, so it takes you a year to get the data and the approvals. You know, that's already um, put you terribly behind time. Current processes for low risk research are so cumbersome at my local health service, a hundred page submission that needs to be signed off by the CEO of a hospital, even for a low risk with site governance from another committee yeah, and, and waiting for signatures uh, can just, it's such a silly bottleneck. This one's a bit stronger. It's time for this benighted country to catch up and begin to rein in these out of control ethics committees. So Anna uh, designed a whole load of scenarios. So these were, you know, we got both researchers and HREX to um, consider some scenarios and, and say whether they thought it uh, required ethics or not, and these were all low risk. Uh, so we have, you can see Anna designed the study really well because we've got a full range of probability here from uh, some examples that nobody thought, or almost nobody thought uh, required ethics all the way up to, to ones that thought everybody thought required uh, an, uh, an ethics approval. The other thing you can see is that for, for every single scenario, uh, it was people who were members of a HREC that were saying that the, the scenario would require uh, approval. So there's a clear difference between researchers and HREX about what needs approval. Another interesting thing, you can also see quite, you know, quite a few projects here in the middle where if you look at the average, it's pretty much 50-50 <laughs> probability that people are giving of, of whether these things need approval or not. So you can see this is, um, this is where some of these problems about consistency come in. And it's funny rereading the national statement to hear that ethics processes have to be consistent, which I think is actually very hard and, and maybe too high a bar. 
The other really interesting thing, we didn't get people to answer all 16, we got people to answer four uh, randomly selected ones. So then we could study, we actually looked at the effects of ordering. So there were ordering effects in this data. So whether somebody answered yes or no to whether something required ethics or not did actually depend on the other three, two or three that they'd already seen. And I think that's really interesting. And I think when we talk about inconsistency, you know, the answer you get could depend on whether you're seen first in the meeting or last in the meeting. Another really interesting uh, corollary out of this research was that a lot of uh, a lot of times people said something like this. The criteria that pushes this over the threshold for ethics review is a desire to publish and disseminate the research further. So again, there's nowhere uh, in the in the national statement that says that that publishing is uh, is a, a requirement for ethics. And there's loads of journals around the world that say, you know, you can say why this didn't need ethics. That, that should go in the paper, of course. Um, but it's it's not a requirement. So we wrote to all the ethics committees about that and got some interesting replies. Now, what we did in terms of trying to make a difference, uh, our little group, um, is that we actually thought, well, let's start a petition because we don't want, uh, if we're going to go and talk to politicians, we thought a petition would be a useful start because we don't want them to just think this is just a few cranky, angry, uh, you know, poor quality researchers. And we managed to get 878 signatures, uh, which was very good. And what we were asking for was a national inquiry. And I think the main reason for doing that is, you know, not asking for something specific, is just because this is such a big and complicated area that I really actually think a national inquiry is needed to look at the different options and to discuss some of the problems and for the politicians to hear um, from some of the leaders in this area about, um, about how bad things can be. We got more great quotes. Our department usually has about 16 active trials at a time and now has a dedicated nurse to manage ethics and governance. This is at a cost of 130,000 a year. So the bureaucracy has become so much that these people, and I've heard, um, and we kind of do this here in a, in a smaller way, you have to employ people just to deal um, with the bureaucracy. I've lost funding previously because our governance requirements could not be met within funding timelines. It's a quote we've heard before. As a busy clinical researcher, I spent hundreds of unpaid hours doing these forms. This is a critical issue because these delays are slowing and in some cases stopping research. This compromises Australia's ability to provide world-class healthcare. The regulatory hurdles are harming patients by delaying vital research. And then what we get for uh, the, one of the quotes that we really like, no country bureau bureaucratized its way to excellence. So what we did is we then took this petition to try and get some political meetings. So we approached Karen Andrews first, mostly because she's literally down the road uh, from Anna's office at Bond University. And we got a meeting with a Karen Andrews staff member, which went very well. We thought we were able to convince that, that person that this was an issue and they agreed to help us put in an executive brief so that was very helpful so with their help we created an executive brief including the petitions the, the, uh, the economic costs and some survey quotes that i just gave you and that was passed on by karen andrew's office straight to greg hunt's office i've also discussed this with labor mp andrew lee who is an ex-researcher understands these issues a lot and we then had a subsequent zoom meeting with a labor staff member nothing came out of that though unfortunately got no response from the greens did meet with Medicines Australia as well, uh, who were very positive about this because they understand the issues around clinical trials and they're potentially a good ally. And we had a session at the AMOS conference and I've frequently often talked with other researchers about this and all our documents are available um, openly. In terms of the economic savings, it's a bit back of the envelope, but um, we thought we were told, well, I know it's a good idea for politicians to talk about money. So we estimate around 14,000 low and negligible research risk applications in Australia for year per year, 65 days we um, on average to, to do that application. So that's a cost of about 11,000, 12,000 per application. So 168 million. Now the costs with an RA, you know, maybe we're overestimating it there because they're not maybe full time on that, but we're also underestimating costs of CIAs and, and, and other more senior researchers being involved. So I could probably pin this down to a more accurate number, um, but I think for ballpark purposes, I think it's, it was okay. So then we said, well, if we move to a simplified system, uh, and which we copied a US system, uh, that would only cost five million. So we could save $163 million in staff time per year. 
And that simplified system is in the US, they have a self-certification system for low and negligible risk research. So the most, by far the most litigious nation in the world uh, has a system where researchers can simply uh, state what they're doing and, and post that uh, online, um, which is, you know, very, uh, I, I would, we, you know, we really think that would be an awesome system here uh, and would save a huge amount of money. And I don't think it would increase risk. What happened with Greg Hunt? Well, it feels a bit like the horizon because he wrote us a letter saying that basically positive change is coming and that there were changes in the pipeline that were coming. And, and I wrote to him as an individual a long while ago about these issues and got almost exactly the same letter. And I don't think anything's changed. And the thing that Greg talked about in his letter, um, I don't think they're going to solve the issue. There, there were small changes. So yeah, I'm afraid our group failed. Uh, we tried really hard and thank you for all those people who signed our petition, but um, we haven't been able to get change here. I don't know why that is. I don't know if we weren't senior enough, if we weren't eminent enough researchers. Uh, maybe Greg's Hunt office just asked some senior people and they said, no, everything's fine, or they, they felt they had bigger fish to fry. We don't know the answer. I would say, I just do find that Australia just does love bureaucracy. I think that's part of the issue here. Um, there is a form for everything. Sometimes there are several forms for things. And I think if you think of some of the changes that we've had, uh, like the move to a site specific approval, you know, with just more forms, I mean, that made things far worse. So it does seem to be a bit of a, a sort of need for a paper trail and a blaming and, and signatures that Often, I mean, that's some of these signatures nobody's ever going to look at, but they're, they're there just for the sort of just in case, you know, we, we, there has to be some some bit of paper that's traceable somewhere. It seems to me that things could actually get worse. There was a consultation by the NHMRC, uh, I think it was last year now. Anyway, a proposed change of the wording in there is that all research should be assessed for level of risk. That's that is potentially disastrous and because the wording matters and ethics committees could interpret that as absolutely all research. So including things like simulation studies and systematic reviews. Um, so, and as Paul Glasio says, if someone starts asking for ethical approval of systematic reviews, I'm prepared to go to jail. Uh, and he said he copied that from a, a quote from Richard Dole. So we really, do not want wording like that in, in any sort of change to the guidelines. I think that would be disastrous. OK, there are some positive changes. So Vanessa Constable uh, here at the Metro North HHS led a project to reduce repeated site specific assessments. And she estimated in a nice little project that she saved about 171 uh, duplicated site specific approvals per year with total cost saved around 49,000. Now, you know, she did that using an implementation science approach. So she mapped it all out. She worked out who she needed to speak to. She went to a lot of meetings. She did a lot of lobbying about this. So, you know, she spent a lot of time and effort um, getting these hurdles removed. And again, for, for no change in risk. And I am aware that Gordon McGurk at, um, uh, at the Royal Brisbane has got a, a, an interesting model as well for improving the way ethics is done, actually putting a lot more research resources into researchers so that the study designs are a lot better so that they should sail through ethics and uh, that you know that sounds very interesting and worth supporting all right i've done my rambling uh sort of time for questions I, i'll just end with this quote i think researchers hate ethics committees i've rarely found a researcher and i mean good researchers mediocre and bad in my realm of work every year who don't bitch about ethics committees I would say that's true when in the old days when we used to go to conferences face to face, if somebody mentioned the word ethics, you know, you'd soon have a whole gaggle of people uh, exchanging their terrible stories. So, uh, you know, this is not constructive. I think something much more constructive would be useful. And I do sometimes wonder whether a sort of one day meeting between both sides, for, for want of a better word to call them both sides, um, whether that would be useful and if that was a joint meeting and we could discuss some of these issues and see if there is a way forward where we can get um, a much more positive uh, and much more worthwhile system. Thank you. Thanks Adrian, that was that was really great. Now I'm we've got a few questions, in fact quite a few questions in the chat. So what I might do is I'm going to group a few of those together that are related. So a couple of people have sort of made the point that you know we obviously have an ethics review process and then a governance review. 
Mm. They weren't really sure at times they felt that the two words were being used interchangeably. And a couple of people have said, you know, their experience of ethics committees has been pretty good, but it's kind of governance where it goes off the rails, which I have to say that that was also our experience as well when we published a paper in 2018. So I wondered if you could comment on that first. Yeah, sure. No, I think, yeah, that's that's possible. I don't know. I For me, the two are bundled up together. I know, yeah, and I know... I know there are good ethics committees out there who, who, yeah, will do good work. But I mean, you know, some of those examples, like the one where they wanted to put it in the bin uh, or, or not put it in the bin and take it to the lab. I mean, that was all the ethics committee. That wasn't that wasn't governance. So I'd, I'd say both can be improved. But yeah, certainly some of the biggest frustration can come around the site specific approvals, you know, especially where you have to wait for these signatures where, you know, you're all you've, you're all ready to go. It's all been signed off. And then there's all this extra bureaucracy uh you know you know some of the stuff around the finance and stuff and again i can see the need for that on one level but often these projects are so tiny there's no financial concerns there's no concerns for a lawyer to get involved in um so we really could streamline a lot of that yeah um we've also got a question about you know what what is your definition of ethics and also I think there's a couple of questions from Dan. Um, definitions of ethics. When does ethics become administration, which I guess is what you've been talking about, and getting ethics as opposed to being ethical? You know, some thoughts around those comments. Yeah, well, look, certainly on that last one, I mean, I have heard sort of vicarious stories of people now. Is lying too strong a word or, or even not getting ethics because yeah they're so sick of the process so that's a big concern i think for australia if things become that bad i don't think i want to come up with it put me on the spot and come up with a definition of ethics no, now. That's all right. that's i mean fine. i know i know what it is from my experience i know with the kind of studies i do i know where the risk points are i know where the pressure points are i know where the effort needs to go to make things right and um, I must say, man, I've had 250, over 250 papers now. I've had one minor issue in, in all of that time, you know, and I think that's the vast majority of experience for most people. There's another question, uh, I think a good question about, um, you know, needing to kind of go to ethics to ask permission to find a question that's really relevant and rural and remote communities you know what's your take on that you need to go to ethics first to go out to the community and consult about the research question that you're then going to study presumably yes. after which you'll go back in again yeah look that's so that's yeah it feels to me it's very similar to my example of just wanting to chat with the patients before we finalize the design of the study i i really think we need to work on that i don't it, i don't see how that needs ethics approval to have a little chat with people about Thermal clothing. Yeah, if you're going to go and chat about, you know, uh, illegal activity or, or something like that, yeah, then maybe. But if you're just going to chat with them about, you know, OK, well, here's some options for some research we could do. Uh, you know, if you met them in the supermarket, you'd be able to do that. I know, I know. Well, I used to sort of have that test as well. You know, yeah. could I ask somebody this in a supermarket? You, you, yeah. That shouldn't really require ethics, I, I feel. Oh. Um, yeah. Yes, interesting. Um, now, let's see. I've got a comment about we need to revamp from the bottom up. What's the use of a national ethics form, for example, if we don't have national committees? It's when we devolve to the state-based systems that we start to hit problems. Yeah, oh, well, the state, I mean, uh, we had a project here. Well, one of the reasons we work in this area is, you know, I think we spent, was it $340,000 and 18 months on the ethics for a, a, a study of 50 hospitals nationwide, you know, and that has just completely put me off doing any nationwide study again um, what a disaster what a waste that was nhmrc funding what a waste of nhmrc funding to spend three hundred eighty thousand on bureaucratic form filling for 50 hospitals what what is the value of the 50th hospital looking at and it was a survey of nurses about when they wash their hands what's the value of that what's the value of the second hospital looking at it? never mind the 50th but all 50 hospitals had to look at it. And I would say some of them did, yeah, just race it through, but we still had to do it. Some of them did not. Some of them wanted different questions and, and all sorts of, of malarkey. 
Yeah, very challenging. I've, we've got a comment for saying, I was once told that good ethics is essentially good manners, simplistic, but I think there is a, con a kernel of truth there. Yeah, look, I feel like I'd agree with that. Um, that yeah, it's it, it's that, well, I had that word trust on, which I didn't comment on earlier, but yeah, trusting researchers to do the right thing and understanding, it, it's, it is kind of hard to teach. It is something you get better at with experience. But yeah, I think just like I said before, like valuing the people involved in the study, imagining if one of your relatives could be in this study and would you be totally comfortable and happy with that? It's always a good test for me. Um, we've got another comment here saying, you know, maybe a faster road to influence locally would be to get more researchers on local committees than taking a broader approach. Um, I can't help feeling that a lot of the slowness is through a lack of understanding of what researchers are wanting to do. Of course, the caveat is that, of course, we're also time poor, but perhaps, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, look, I'm sympathetic to that idea too. And uh, there was a statistician in uh, Canberra who had a big push for getting statisticians on ethics committees, which I thought would be great for improving the research design, kind of like the, what I mentioned with Gordon McGurk earlier, where he's looking to improve the quality of applications and study designs. But unfortunately, we have a national shortage of statisticians in Australia, so I can't imagine how that is going to happen. Um, I totally support it, and I think it would be good. But yeah, without that expertise there, it's, I wouldn't even try. Is that something that you could even think about? Oh yeah, no. Anyway, I'll keep I'll keep going. There's so many good questions. I'm going to get to all of them. Um, so here's another one. Um, any in any discussions with politicians was funding from industry such as pharmaceutical companies discussed? Um, like, the, you know, there's there's indication that clinical trials bring a lot of money to Australia yeah. as a large country with a small population. Pharmaceutical companies need a reason to conduct trials in Australia. Um, efficient processes could be one. I think that's a good point. Yeah, look, we definitely pushed that angle because we had a lot of comments from people saying uh, our colleagues overseas now no longer do trials in Australia because they've had horrible experiences compared to other countries. That we weren't the only people to say that. I think Medicines Australia have been telling politicians that for a while. So there has been some action there, and you will see there are some government um, there are some government policies on this to try and attract clinical trials to Australia. So there may be some improvement there. But you know, big international clinical trials are a pretty small proportion of what we do. I'm much more. I mean, if we could fix low and low risk studies. And just sorry, just to relate it to that one point I forgot to make was, you know, if you get rid of these very low risk studies from committees, they could actually focus all their time and attention on the, on the more difficult studies. And so that would be good for everybody, good for them, good for us. The queues would go down and you'd actually, because it can be exhausting to look at all these things. If you want to spend your time on the, on the ones that are actually tricky. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, there's also a question, is there a perhaps a perception within research governance offices that not identifying problems, even if they're minor, is not doing due diligence? And I think that is something that, you know, we've thought about in the literature as well, you know, that need that sometimes staff kind of take a bit of a it all has to be looked at approach. Yes. Whenever I've had something that I think is negligible risk, and now I stop doing it, I would write to the ethics committee and say, I'm pretty sure this is negligible risk just checking. They always say, put an application in and we'll tell you. And then you go, oh. so now I have to put an application in. So yeah, I'm trusting myself now more. I have, you know, being very familiar with the statement, making sure. Uh, but, you know, for junior researchers, that's that's a big ask. So if you're not confident, you can end up getting approval for stuff, which you never really needed to. I think there's some other question, you know, other comments about the fact that, you know, of course, it's hard getting people on a committee because it's usually mm. an unpaid role. And someone also says that they're having enough trouble getting a statistician on the research team, which I'm sure that's a comment that you're familiar with, Adrian. Yeah, yeah. Look, and I should say, I think I've got to say, Sally, I'm, I'm enormously appreciative of those people who give their time over for ethics committees. Um, and yeah, and the, the, yeah, there is a serious lack of, of good skills in stats and um, epidemiology, I would guess as well. We've got another comment just saying, how, you know, how do we solve the problem that there is a small number of ethics breaches that do undermine trust from both the public and the politicians, and how do we balance these real risks of 
for example, privacy breaches or greater harms against the benefits of research? Yeah, I think if you look in, this is interesting. So um, I think Tim Harford wrote a good book on this about failure. And I think one of the things he said was, if you sometimes if you're not, if there's nothing going on, if there's no, if there's no breaches, if there's nothing going badly wrong, it's actually a sign that you're doing really conservative stuff. You're no, we're nowhere near the edge. So look, I know it's terrible, but the number of issues I've heard about the number that come to light are, are very small. The ones I hear about more are where people, you know, have just made up data. Now that's more, I'd say, a university, something that universities should be taking on rather than an ethics committee. I know they do get involved. So I think, so this is okay, very much my personal bias. And as I said earlier, I would have a much higher tolerance for risk and, and for, because I think the hidden costs of this research that is not being done massively outweighs those rare times when things go wrong. And I think a good point too is that even unfortunately ethics committees are not well placed to pick up issues like fraudulent applications because that's a very, yeah. very difficult thing for anyone yeah. to pick up, you know. So as some stuff will go through, just can't be picked up really, you know, as you say. So Exactly. And yeah. I would never say that it was their fault that they should have spotted that person. No. Um, yeah. We've got some sort of, we've got some war stories, um, <laughs> needing to seek permission from 37 universities to send their staff members ECRs in STEM a request to take part in research about their job satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, but being permitted to recruit by social media. Yeah. Ridiculous. Uh, similar story, I had to get 17 ethics committees to agree for us to survey their final year rural medical students and I have to update that every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, it is a real shame. We, we like from the surveys and from the petition, we got loads of these stories, loads. And I really felt that that would get some political traction. You know, it did achieve our aim of not just saying it's just just me and Jenny here are really annoyed because, you know, we had one bad experience. It was it was lots of people with very similar experiences, costing time and money. You know, the government we have at the moment, see, you know, they're, they're very much against red tape you know that's one of their mantras so I really thought it would have appealed to them as well but for some reason it just it just didn't. I think we've got a, a comment sort of encouraging people to um, you know call and talk to HREC officers which I would say I've also yeah. had a lot of experience with I think that that's great advice and people can be very helpful and you know help you put things in the right direction sometimes yeah. I wonder whether there's that same opportunity with governance you know, whether people sort of contact their ethics committees more readily than they talk to their governance departments. Is that part of it? Someone's saying, yeah, ethics officers love it when you ring them before putting the application in. Of course, you know, that, that mm. yeah, these yeah, are great yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. And look, that's, I do sometimes think about arranging a meeting. I don't, don't know where we get the money from. But yeah, that's maybe the sort of thing that we could Talk about yeah, how we I, encourage that more because, yeah, I agree. Once you chat I with think somebody. You would think there would be some money, though, for a one-day meeting and particularly an online kind of meeting between just to get these kind of issues talked about. Yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. you know, somebody else has also, um, someone else has also said, you know, just the need for dialogue, particularly around the area of biobanking, which I can also say, you know, sometimes there's not, you know, Ethics committees aren't very familiar necessarily with with biobanking, what that actually means, and so yeah, I think we do really need to be able to have that dialogue so that each side, well not side, but you know, the different groups understand each other. So we've got a comment. Um, is there any forum where research ethics committees can chat with one another to help them be more in line with each other? So you know? yeah, they used to be apparently. That, that that used to happen and then uh the funding was cut for it so yeah that's something that should should probably be reinstated because the person i spoke to the ethics expert from the nhmrc did think that was helpful so yeah good comment yeah yeah that is a good comment um yeah yes yeah, suggestions that people do need to read the national statement which of course um i think that's fantastic Andrew. do you want to maybe if you could put your so if you've got time, I know it's in the talk. Do you want to pop it into this? You could put it into the oh, yeah. chat so that, you know, people are, are out walking, I even got, people in uh, lockdown. 
Section three and four are proving uh, <laughs> difficult, so I haven't got those sections in yet, but they will appear. Someone's saying um, also that Praxis has that type of forum, but they're not sure. Not sure what Praxis is. Is that a clinical trial support group or? I don't know. Look, we've only got a couple, we've got a couple of minutes left. I think we've had some great questions. I did see one question that I didn't get to, which was about trust. How do we how do we engender trust in our research environment? Possibly. Yeah, and I talked with the ABS about this, you know, because they obviously do uh, sorry, this is Journey Bureau Statistics, you know, they release data, you know, some big big data linkage studies. And yeah, I did, we did talk about the idea, I don't know how far it went, of having trusted researchers. So if you've been through all their training, you know, you tick off, you've been through their online training, then you can get more and more access. Um, and I like that model. That that seems to make perfect sense to me. The more experienced you are, the the, the more you should be allowed to get yeah, access. Yeah, could that disadvantage ECRs though? Possibly, but then if you're an ECR, start out smaller. Yeah. Start, you know, the, the, the data you can get from the ABS uh, with just as a member of the public is pretty fantastic. So mm. it's only, uh, you know, it's only when you're getting out to the much more uh, minute and, and geolocated data that you, you need to be uh, logged onto the system. Well, I think that was a fantastic talk and I just want to thank everybody who added such great questions and comments to the chat. I think this is such a live issue. We've had so yeah. many people, you know, here today. It's something that affects all of us. And I think you're right. We all want to do the right thing as researchers. Everybody does. Um, we just want, I think it's in everybody's interest if that can be a little bit easier sometimes. And I do agree that we are probably losing a lot of opportunities to do some really pretty simple studies that are very low risk mm. that could have real benefits for patients, families, communities that at the moment are just, unfortunately, researchers are putting those things in the too hard basket. And I know I'm one of them. So there's probably many other people out there. Um, but yeah, look, thanks so much. Great talk. And uh, the recording will be available in a couple of weeks for people that couldn't get here today. Um, in the meantime, everybody, yes, yeah, stay safe and check out our website for upcoming talks. Thanks so much. Adrian, do you need to run off or do you want to stay for a couple of minutes? No, I can stay for a couple of minutes, yeah. yeah.